reading. And as we looked with the kids at the Christian um, calendar of the year, um, there is also um, a pairing of scriptures that go with this, um, the lectionary. And so if um, many churches follow it, and so even if you were in Catholic Mass today, um, you would hear the passage um, from the gospel um, that we read before this passage from Revelation. So it's a way to try to get... Um, reading, um, scripture reading into the worship services that will cover almost the whole Bible every three years. Um, and so we come um, to this season and every single year of this cycle, whether it we're in year A, B, or C, the first Sunday of Advent begins with an apocalyptic lesson, with the second coming, when Christ will return. And so in this season, as we wait for Christ to come and we remember how Christ came as a baby, we also turn to look at what it means for Christ to come again, the end times, and what that will mean, what, that whole, what truth that holds for us, what importance that holds for us as followers of Christ. But apocalyptic literature, as hard as it is to say, it's even harder to read um, because it's really intense and the imagery is powerful and there are no punches that are pulled. Um, we had to set up a uh, do a Bible study in seminary uh, for the book of Revelation because our professor told us if you could do this, then you can do any Bible because this is the hard, any book because this is the hardest book because it is the most confusing and and it has been used in many different ways and it's got language that is strong. And we have just a taste of that um, in the passage that we read today at the end. Evil is real. When we take our baptism vows, we vow to say no to the forces of evil and the, um, the powers of evil and the forces of wickedness in our world. In every yes and saying yes to following Christ, there is a no that we are saying as well. We are saying no to certain things. Um, part of those things are lined out for us in the Ten Commandments and are reiterated in that gospel passage in Revelation of not murdering, of not taking another's life, of not stealing. Um, and, and all of that has to do with how we use our power. Um, and so with each of us created in the divine image, with each of us given gifts and graces and power in terms of how we live, do we use that in such a way that builds up others and ourselves, or do we use it in ways that harm others um, for us to benefit from that? And that is always the question And following Christ, is how do we use our power? What way do we choose? Do we choose a way that is only for us, or do we choose a way that leaves room for others? And as we follow a God who is triune, who is relational in God's very core, that is our call to relationship, to how we live in the fullness of that love that gives room for the particularity and the uniqueness of each gift and of each person, but it also binds us together in a unity of purpose and of sharing, like we talk with our kids, um, that is beyond our wildest imaginations. And that brings a life that is more abundant than we could ever dream of. But there's this thing called fear that gets in the way a lot. And so even though we want to follow the Ten Commandments, even though we know what is right, we still don't act upon it or do it. And here's the scariest part. We don't even realize sometimes that we're doing harm when we are. Because we can do harm even when our intentions are to do good. But we can get so caught up in the sin and the evil that is pervasive that we don't even recognize the water that we're swimming in. And because of all of this complication and because of how hard it is and because of how much God loves us, God became incarnate 
And this is the season we celebrate Jesus. We celebrate Emmanuel, God with us. So that there is someone at a particular time and a particular place with a particular group of people in our history where God was embodied, where we could touch him, where we could follow him, where we could listen to him, where we could watch him and how he interacted and how he lived, where we could see faithfulness personified, where we could watch all of the spiritual fruit that we have talked about lived out in their fullness in perfection. And so all of a sudden, the letter of the law comes alive in its love and in its fulfillment. And we get this glimpse to get it, to finally see and be like, ah, that's what God was trying to teach us. That's what we are to be about here. And it's been a couple thousand years since that moment of particular time in history. And even then, it was still hard for that truth to break into our sin and to our misunderstandings and our limitations and open us up to a wider love and a wider truth. But just as that resurrection happened all of those years ago, there are these moments of the inbreaking that happen here today and now too. And this is what we celebrate. This is the candle of hope that we light, that no matter how powerful the darkness comes and is, that there is a living God who is working to bring forth life and wholeness and who will always be bringing light to the darkness. And so we are here. For those trapped in our own nights of fear and of injustice and of terror, we know that there is a Christ who has been through that violence and the worst and who knows the way out and who is walking beside us to bring that light into our darkness. And when the darkness is so thick that we can't even trust that or see that anymore, we come together as a family and a body to sing and to pray for each other until the day when we are able to sing and pray again ourselves. This is what it means to journey together. This is what it means to bring hope together, to be people who follow a God who make the impossible possible. And this is the Advent season where Christ comes as a baby born to an illiterate mother in a backwater province of a huge empire and topples the entire thing in turning the world upside down. So God is sending his son to be with us. But will we know him when he comes? Will we be ready are we ready for this journey? And here's the kicker that we're going to spend this season of Advent looking at. And here's why we pair these two together. Barry, could you bring up that first slide um, from Revelation? We are celebrating the one who came, the one who comes, and the one who will come in final victory. That direction is all about heaven coming to earth, of the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. And the funny thing is, culturally, the way we look at our Christian goal is to make it through this life to join God in heaven, to go up. And that's absolutely a part of the journey but it's not the end of the journey. That's not the end goal. The end goal is for heaven to come to earth and for earth to be as heaven. Do you, the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it already is in heaven. 
And so that's what we're going to talk about this season of is the direction of our salvation and is the direction of this end goal and this end vision. And it's going to have all kinds of implications for how we think about death and the community of saints and our purpose as Christians and as followers of Christ. And it's wild and it's really different. Um, from what we've been taught culturally, and we'll unpack that a little bit more and why that is in Bible study and some of the sermons here. But just this first line um, is one we skip over so easily. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the former heaven and the former earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. What does it look like for us who die to go to heaven, and we know that that happens immediately because Jesus says to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. But what does it look like to have an entire community of saints who are working just as much as the family of Christ here on earth to bring forth a day, to wait and be ready for a day when Christ will come in fullness and that heaven and this earth will both pass away and there will be a new heaven and a new earth that are completely one where there is no more mourning or crying or pain or death. There are no more people killed from terrorist attacks. There are no more people who die from random outbreaks of infection and disease. There are no more deaths. There are no more empty places around Thanksgiving tables. There are no more wars over whose land is whose. There are no more deaths from hurricanes that come and take houses and homes. There are no more deaths. There are no more abuses of power. Everyone has a place, and everyone's tears will be wiped from their eyes. Are we ready for those who do the harming to be saved? We're ready for those who are harmed to be saved. But are we ready for those who act out of their pain to also have no more pain? Are we ready for all of us to not have to have a crisis where our world falls apart and we have to steal ourselves to be able to live and to not fall into the temptation of using our power to share this pain and to inflict somebody else with it to lessen our own? Are we ready to not have to pray and beg our way through to be strong enough to have God tumble our pain over in a way that does not spread the pain to more people. I'm ready. I'm ready for a day of hope where all will be as God created it to be. A vision of shalom, of wholeness, of abundance, of life, of love, of peace, of justice and of fun and joy that fills our hearts to overbrimming, of not having to be feared, fearful or scared of one another or what might happen, and, and to have one of those glorious days without that overhanging thought of like, oh my gosh, this is too perfect. What's going to happen? What, where is the shoe going to fall next? Because this can't last. It's too good. What if we have those moments where it is too good and it is for forever? That is what we wait for. That is what we crave. This is the season. Will you wait? And will you wait in such a way that more and more people can taste and can catch a vision of what it means, of what it will mean to have a new heaven and a new earth? Let us wait in hope. Because we know the God we serve, and we know what God is capable of bringing about.
blessed Advent. As we commit ourselves to waiting, one of the hardest things in the whole entire world, um, we come to do it together. And so I invite you to come um, to the studies um, that will be happening to talk through what all of this means in terms of God's final coming and, and heaven rule, um, being present on earth um, and God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven. Um, I am a very fallible human being, and so I do ask your uh, forgiveness and work with me in that I have double booked this coming Thursday and didn't even realize it. Um, so if you are in the small group leader training and being ready for a uh, logistics meeting this Thursday, as we talked about, um, can we meet um, up here after church to figure out what we're going to do? Um, because I studied and uh, set an Advent study, and I do want to do the Advent study. Um, and thank you um, for waiting and working with me as we figure out all of these different pieces. Um, we just need Jesus to return, right? And then we won't have to worry about all these different folks because we'll just be singing and eating and having a good old time together. But until that time comes, um, join us for the Advent study study on Thursday, and leaders, we're going to figure out how we rework ourselves um, in preparation as well. We're going to be in this journey together. There are going to be good days, and there are going to be bad days, but we are in it together with a God who will always be bringing us hope.